In uh, Colossians chapter 1, <clears throat> and um, mm, I think last week, didn't we get uh, canceled because of rain? Okay. So two weeks ago, we had this chart on the board, and we went over it. And there's only one part that I want to um, uh, add a little to it. Um, for those of you who don't have it or can't write fast enough, I think it is on the website. Is that what we said? Okay. It's on the website. <clears throat> I wrote it there, too. Um, hi, Chris. Hey. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> I... Deb mentioned to me today that um, we're going to have to, because of the Ireland trip and several other things, we're going to have less classes than we normally would. Yeah, but in Colossians. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, to your chagrin, I'm going to move past these scriptures except to say <clears throat> that when we talked about this, maybe I should move a little bit. <laughs> um, it's just a progression to the firstborn. Uh, is this still class number four? Four, is it? Okay, good. I cannot remember. We talked about the eternal Son of God before time. We, we talked about him, the incarnation and when he walked the earth as the only begotten Son. We talked about him going to, into death. We talked about the firstborn son and resurrection and all the little crosses are in there <clears throat> because we are in there. We are his body and um, <clears throat> the lamb in us will continue to give his life. Okay, so this is, um, this is the resurrected Christ who gives himself continually in death, in loss. In weakness okay that's the lamb slain on the throne the resurrected Christ so that's an ongoing thing that is in fact it is so ongoing that it is the resurrection and the life he is the resurrection and the life of the resurrection okay and this is eternity future meaning this is eternal life right here, this firstborn son. This is the one that we have received. This is the life that we have. This is the abundant life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and on, the only other thing on this chart was that I was charting <clears throat> that Jesus was born again. And some of y'all were in some of the classes leading up to it. We talked about the Son of God who had no birth, and then we talked about the progression to the only begotten Son. He was born in a manger, so there he was born. We talked about the cross, there he died, and we talked about the resurrection uh, not as the only begotten anymore, but as the firstborn among many. Okay, so... We went into great lengths with all of that. But now I'd like to move to verse uh, 25, starting with verse 25. Because this book is full of wonderful things. <clears throat> but what we, what we begin to see um, uh, down in verse 27, but everything that leads up to it and the verses after it in the first um, chapter what we begin to see Paul presenting to the Colossians is a similar thing, that, but not in the same manner that he presented to the Galatians. <clears throat> and in the Galatian, to the Galate, well, let me just explain what I'm talking about. Um, he is talking about the Jesus that he preaches. Okay. And he, was, he contrasted it in Galatians, and he'll contrast it all the way through the end of the first chapter and into the second chapter of 
the point that he's trying to make. And the point he's trying to make is that <clears throat> um, there are some uh, in Galatians, there are some who've come in and they're Judaizers and they're adding to or taking away from the gospel. Uh, in this case, there are people with vain philosophies and things that are making the gospel something, here it comes, other than what he has seen it to be. And what he's seen it to be is Christ, not just salvation. And what he's seen it to be is Christ revealed in us, not just Christ revealed to be our Savior. Okay? So <clears throat> it's important that we, we can follow that flow in Colossians, because I think uh, most of us have done that in Galatians. But in Galatians 1, 12, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel that I received was not after man, neither was I taught it. Okay, not after man, and neither was I taught it by the religious leaders, but it came by the revelation, the unveiling of Christ. And in saying that as a Jew, he is saying it comes by going into, getting to the Holy of Holies and God ripping that open, not when Jesus just died on the cross, but when Jesus died on the cross as it were in us. The unveiling, the veil that separated them where they could never see the one that they loved and served, or served, certainly. Um, <clears throat> Paul, as a Jew and as a, as a Pharisee at one time, um, addresses his understanding not in just Christian terms, and I say that because they saw everything in light of the Old Testament. And they saw him in the Old Testament. And there was no New Testament uh, at that time. And so, <clears throat> so when he says the unveiling, the revealing, he's talking about the veil being rent where he can see the one whose hands did this or whose heart had this but we didn't really know him or all of the things that pertain to him now it's a him and it's not bread that represents him and it's not the seven branch candlestick that represents him that is not him and it's not the altar of incense that represents him but is clearly not him and it's not the brazen altar outside that is uh, where everything goes into death which represents him. Now there, he's seeing, as it were, the lamb upon the throne. <clears throat> the throne of grace, folks, is the mercy seat. That's, you know, Hebrews explains that, but I mean, that's what, what it is, see? And that was the understanding that God was trying to impart <clears throat> was within the realm. So, so in that sense, that's why uh, Jesus came and said, you know, <clears throat> the law is not going to be done away until it's all fulfilled. Well, we go, okay, so I'll keep it until Jesus fulfills it. Or, or, or we don't have to keep it because Jesus hadn't fulfilled it anymore. The law spoke of Christ. The law was a picture of him. Had there been a law given that could have given his life, verily righteousness would have been by his life, like it is for us. But it wasn't because the law wasn't to reveal his life until the Spirit of God came. The law was to condemn our life. Okay, so for whatever reason, I keep preaching the book of Galatians in this Colossians <laughs> class, but that's, <clears throat> that's what he's saying. And so back to, you know, when he said uh, in verse 12, uh, <clears throat> it came by the revelation of Christ. And then he, he literally, he literally tells you what that revelation was. That revelation was when God separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. Does that sound similar to verse 27 of Colossians 1? Christ in you, the hope of glory. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 
So they're running along similar lines. Their, their emphasis is, is similar, but I don't think they were written at the same time like Ephesians was. And so, so they're having a, 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 a di little bit different angle, but it's all Jesus, and it's all meant to be Jesus, not far away in heaven, but Christ revealed in us. And it's meant to be, you know, the law, folks, was given to our life. It had our life in mind. The gospel is not given to our life. It has his life in mind. <laughs> this is the beauty of it. This is the, this is, Jesus fulfilled the law. He didn't keep it. He was the fulfillment of it all because by his nature, um, he, he's the fulfillment of it. <clears throat> the law was a shadow of him, of that life. That's why had there been a law given that could have been that life, Woo, we'd be on track, but there wasn't such a thing. All right, so Colossians now, Colossians 1, starting with verse 25. Where have I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God? And um, I've always simplified that. There's several angles for dispensation, but I've always simplified it just to be the intention of God. Whatever it is, it's the intention of God. <clears throat> whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you. So now he's about to present himself and what he feels God has shown him as the gospel or as the reality that we preach and that we minister. I am made a minister. Now this is going to be important because it will go all the way into chapter 2. These, these verses are very important to chapter 2. I, the what I minister, I'm going to tell you about. All right? What I'm called to as a minister, I am about to express to you what that is. <clears throat> and he calls it to fulfill the word of God. Well, what fulfilled the law? What fulfills the New Testament? Jesus. I mean, you, you can read that in Hebrews. He's the fulfillment of all that the Father had in his heart. And he is that whether he's, as it were, dying on an altar as a lamb for our sins. He is the fulfillment of that, of the Father's heart. Or whether it is just being the life, which is selfless in its nature, that fulfills what the Father wanted. That's why he had to put Christ in us. Do you understand? That? That's why he had to put Christ in us because to him, now this is another important point, because to him, he wanted us to have life and he wanted it to be this, this son or this son. Okay, so... Um, so what the people in Colossians are doing is that they're teaching all kind of good stuff, okay? But it's not Christ, okay? Um, for example, Paul goes through here, and he goes through Galatians too, uh, and he hardly mentions Jesus died for your salvation. His emphasis, his emphasis is the life of Christ, not just Christ, not just him raised to a throne, but him being the resurrection in, this, in, our, in the body of Christ from the dead. You remember that? Okay. And the literal words there says, when it says that he was raised from the dead, most of you know this, I think. Half of you know this that he was raised from among the dead, okay? And in that sense, it is saying that he, he was raised up out from us and became the life of those who received him as the life. Okay, do you have to receive him as Savior first? Yes, yes. But we're not, you know, like some people think that throughout the eternal ages to come, we're going to be going... Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for, you know, or something like that. 
There are the riches of Christ, and Colossians talks about that. The riches that are Christ, that we, and he is without beginning and without end. So I think, I think we're going to be busy. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be boring. <clears throat> All right, so it's really, really important to, to read these verses, uh, particularly all together as we go into chapter 2, to read them in light of Paul is addressing people that are sharing things that miss the mark, and the mark is Christ, that it needs to be Christ in you, the hope of glory, all right? And so he's going to be weaving the thing that I preach. I'm called to be a minister to this. He's trying to really press the point that, look, this thing is greater than just sin. You know, you, that would be a little bit like walking into the tabernacle and, you know, killing the lamb and then going out and go, I'm saved, I'm free. And then everybody's walking around the camp going, I'm saved, I'm free. And Paul's going, I'm going as far as I can get. And he gets to the veil and God op opens it. God opens that veil and he sees the one whom all of this stuff was just shadows. So, so we could be the same as the Jews in that they, they looked at what happened when the lamb was slain and on the altar and then they walk out and live their own life. We can look at that like 2,000 years ago Jesus died on a cross and we walk out and we say we're saved. Amen? God wants his son. God wants his son in a particular place. He wants him in us. He wants it lived, which means he wants him to live. And he's going to live a certain way. Okay, so, you know, the commandment, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not do this. All that is fulfilled in love, which is by this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You perceive the love of God in terms of sacrifice and death that others may have life. Okay. Now, of course, we're not talking about <clears throat> that we are redemptive when Jesus lays down his life through us. There is a certain truth to that, but it's not the same redemption. It is the release of his life because of death. Paul said uh, bearing about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus so that death works in me but life in you, right? I'm sorry if I sound preachy, but I believe this. <laughs> I do. Um, all right. Wherefore, I am made a minister according to the intention of God which is given to me for you. I know that I, this is Paul talking, I know that I exist not just to share that you're saved by Jesus who walked the earth, a good man that was God, but he died and then he left. But he's still here in us. He's the life of the body and of the party. Not really. Not that. Just making sure you're paying attention. <clears throat> All right. Um, so this is, this is an important thing also that he's trying to do is, you know, the, in Jerusalem, now Paul is traveling around, in Jerusalem, they understood certain things, and you can find it in the book of Acts, but they never mentioned Christ in you. They never mentioned that he died so that we'd all be dead. Not in the book of Acts, unless it's Paul, <laughs> which is most of the book of Acts, so I guess it is there. Um, but, but the church at Jerusalem, while Paul is traveling around and the Spirit of God is opening his eyes and his heart to this reality, <clears throat> they're still going with, you know, um, the remission of sins, and you get a lot of that, especially at the beginning, first bunch of chapters, <clears throat> stuff like that. 
So remember, they literally called him and, and Barnabas back and said, hey, what are y'all preaching? And that, back to Galatians, Paul gives, gives his story of, you know, this is what happened. <clears throat> and um, so Paul is doing that because this is not just new to everybody he preaches to. This is new to the church at Jerusalem. This is a further extent. This would indeed be like everybody in Jerusalem in the new church, the fledgling church that is there, has gone through and seen the reality of Christ in all of those symbols until they get to the veil. But they've seen the reality of all those symbols in Jesus. Seeing the reality of all those symbols in Jesus is not Jesus. It's seeing the reality of all those things in him. Paul is talking about seeing Jesus, having him revealed in you. You know, when it pleased God who called me by his grace, and there's the, here's, his, here's his way he handles grace to reveal his son in me. He called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. It's all one sentence. There's no break. Of course, so is the first chapter of, of Galatians. All one sentence, no break. <laughs> he just didn't use periods very often. Anyway, so... So then, you know, so so he's declaring that the gospel to him is not just Christ, or not. No, let's start with it's not just that Jesus came and died and saved us. <clears throat> it is that Jesus came back, as it were, in us. He is the resurrection. He is our resurrection. Even if we're looking forward to some day of a if, uh, of a bodily resurrection. The assurance of that, if that's what it's going to be, the assurance of that is that he's your resurrection now. That's the assurance of that. All right? So, now, the bodily resurrection is if we're his body. You know? <clears throat> All right. So then he goes on to say, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, and this is this word mystery is important to, <clears throat> it's important, a whole New Testament, um, but particularly um, when Paul uses it la later on in chapter 2 and further, um, he's referring to Christ in you, Christ being revealed in you. He's referring, he's not, he doesn't use the word here and then later on go, well, there's, you know, there's some mysteries, you know, and you'd go, well, wonder what those are. That's the thing that God, well, the scriptures will declare it here. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, we sort of read this and we go, okay, so it's been hid from generations and it's been, you know, um, for, for ages. Uh, in that, we still use our Gentile minds and we go, you know, from the beginning or whatever. Yes. But Paul is walking through the tabernacle of reality. He knows that that veil's been up for ages and generations. He knows that, Christ, that, the, that God has been back there, you know, and as all the Jews did, but now he's made known. And how did he get made known? Okay, so we go, we go, well, you know, when the veil was rent, when it was tore open, we saw him, and we were, we were changed. Okay, but 
the amazing thing is, is that when that veil was rent, when it was torn open, they didn't see him in there. That thing got tore open when Jesus died on the cross. You're going to have to go out on Mount Calvary to see the reality of the God who's been hidden. Because he's still hidden out there, if you will. Nobody went, oh, my God, not till Paul did, you know. And, you know, there might have been a guy named Mike or something that did. I don't know. But, I mean, Paul's the one who God used to really make it known, you know. And so, <clears throat> so the, the veil is rent. And we're looking for, um, we're looking for uh, something that matches our concepts that we've been waiting to see in there, okay? So that could be a, a hundred, a thousand, five thousand things because everybody has their own concepts of, of what it's going to be like when I come to a revelation of Christ. And you can hear somebody talk and you go, you go, uh, okay, so it's like a, you know, uh, I, I haven't used this example in a long time, but, you know, I always think of the story of the, the what blind man of India and they somebody brings in an elephant you know <clears throat> they say this is an elephant and one of them grabs his leg and says the elephant is like a tree trunk you know a tree another one grabs the <clears throat> the tail and says the elephant is like a rope or a, you know and one of them grabs you know so on and on uh, his ear and says well he's like a you know elephant ear leaf <clears throat> <laughs> and they go, you're right. <laughs> um, the point being that as long as you're blind, whatever you do get hold of, you're going to equate the whole thing to that. And Jesus is so much more than any of us can fathom. And, and, and it should be exciting for us to want to just press in to know the Lord more and more and more. We go, well, don't you think you know enough? <laughs> yes, I, I know enough. Now I just want pure life, oh, pure I Jesus. You know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not after knowing anymore. I don't want to be deep. I want to know life. I want to know Jesus. I want to know him the way he wants to be known instead of based on the things that he has done for us <clears throat> that are temporal things that he's done for our temporal lives he is something more than a temporal time traveler. <laughs> something like that. Coming in and touching and then we need to know the eternal son. <clears throat> and the best way to know him is, yes, by the spirit. But to really know the son, the spirit, the son is not the son to the Holy Spirit. He's, he's that to the Father. So Ephesians begins, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so Jesus is here, as it were. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in that guy right there, Jesus Christ, the Son. You see what I mean? And you begin to honor to whom honor is due. You ever heard that scripture? So we only apply that down here but we need to see that in realms of of the eternal <clears throat> all right so uh verse 27 to whom god would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the gentiles which is christ in you the hope of glory all right so you know what uh, let me read another translation here <clears throat> As a minister, I do this in one accord with the ministry of dispensing Christ, which was given to me for the hungry in order to make the message fully known to you all. The word that I preach is the mystery that has been unknown and unappreciated for ages, but the veil is rent for those separated to it. To the separated ones, God was so pleased to make known the real riches of God's glorious resources in us, which is Christ's life in us, our only hope for living gloriously, because he is the glory to the Father. He is the one who is 
the glory to the Father. Um, I think it's in the, at the one of the last verses in Romans, but I could be wrong. It says, um, to God be glory in the church through Jesus Christ. God, the Father, get glory in the church, but only through Jesus Christ. See. Hallelujah. All right. So, to whom God would make known. So, there's a... There is a making known <clears throat> of what's in God's heart, to whom God would make known. There's a making known of what's in God's heart. So we have to move from looking at God <clears throat> as a businessman who's written up a plan, the plan of God, who's written up a plan that we, you know, we can study to figure it out. What we need to do is realize the plan is in his heart, and it's his son. It's his son. But to know that, there is no paper, there is no written plan in that sense. And if there was, it would mess us up much more because we'd study the words and think we got it. You have to see the son. That's why Paul is saying that and saying it here. He must be revealed in us. And again, all that we have passed through, like in the tabernacle, and known, oh, this represents Jesus. No, oh, this is, uh, no matter how glorious that is, and, and if, if it's a straight shot directly from God to you, it is still not him until the veil is rent, and then the, re the revelation of that must include Christ revealed in us, the hope of glory. And as I've always seen, I don't believe that's our, just our hope. It is our hope, but I believe it's God's hope. I believe it's the Father's hope, Christ in us. That's his hope for, for glory in this situation. So... Um, and, and here's the good thing about the next time that we share is that we're going to really see how emphatic Paul feels that the Lord, that the Father is when he's writing that, that no matter what you teach, no matter what philosophy you've come up with of this, because that's to him, if it's not the life of Christ, it's a philosophy, even if it's using his name. It's, it still lacks the image, the very image of the invisible God. So uh, that's, the, that's the beauty of what we see, particularly when we get into the second chapter. That um, presence of mind in relationship to, it's very similar to, to Hebrews, actually, in the sense that he keeps saying, well, that's da-da-da-da but it's not Christ. Well, da-da-da-da, but it's not Christ. Da-da-da-da, but it's not Christ. See? So, if there, if, the, if there couldn't be a contrast made between one who had passed through the tabernacle and seen the highest things of their meaning, and truly it was spirit-given and of God, um, but, and yet someone said, but behind that veil... There is the very reality of it all in living form to be brought forth in you. They may not get that. Could you see how they could go, what are you talking about? I have, I have seen Christ. And you go, well, no, you've seen Christ in these things. But you haven't seen Christ behind the veil. And that, so can you see how a Jew, a Pharisee, a, a, a person who, is, um, who understands these things in, in a proper perspective would say, you know, be so emphatic that uh, this, is, this is what God's been waiting for all ages and for all time and everything. Anything else that has happened 
is only a shadow or, or is only a message or a revealing of that being a reality of him, but not yet the reality of him in you. See. And to me, once you pass through those things and you see all of that and then the veil is rent and you see him, you don't think, you don't have to work with the utensils. <laughs> I don't know, because there's the fulfillment. There it is. It's a hymn, and it's a life. Had there been a law given which had given life, verily, but the purpose isn't seeing or, or understanding, or, and Paul even deals with that again in the second chapter, or um, uh, uh, the experiences, every experience that you've had up to that time is not what has been prepared from the foundation of the world till now. This experience, the veil being rent, and as Paul said, when it pleased God. Okay, well, you know, I'm ready. It doesn't say when you're pleased. Because your heart may not be right. You, if he opened that and you saw it, you're liable to run around and try to make yourself famous with what you've seen. You know? Say, oh, look, look at that. I've seen the Lord and, you know, da 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 da. And, you know, gather and let's have a big church and everybody come and. He's Galatians again. At the appointed time of the Father, God sent forth his Son into my heart, crying, Abba, Father. Galatians chapter 4. At the time appointed of the Father, he doesn't send forth a revelation. He sends forth a Son revealed. We're not seeking a revelation. We're seeking the Son. And it says that he sends forth the spirit of his Son into your heart, crying out by Father. And he's saying, that cry is not you. That's you have the spirit of the Son now. He's been unveiled and you've seen him in relationship to the Father and you've seen the heart of the Father in relationship to that Son and the Father. And you know, that's, you know, they were under tutors and governors and all the things, you know, in relationship to training, child training. That's what the word tutors and governors represents, child training, because we were immature and our immaturity was we didn't see what was behind the veil, even if we had all these great revelations of him in those things. We still didn't see him, the life of him, sent forth into our heart, crying, not quietly going, yes, Father, I'm here. I'm your son. I guess he'd have to be British. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, it's that, it is um, a cry, a cry from the son to the father out of us, an eternal cry, an eternal uh, a fulfillment. Now is the word of God fulfilled. Remember, that's what Paul said, to fulfill the word of God. Now is the word of God fulfilled. The logos, the, the thought of, the complete thought of God, crying, Abba, Father. And you know, the word Abba is a very intimate term for Father. Um, you don't you don't come into that kind of intimacy by searching or stacking up revelations. You come into that when when it pleased God to reveal His Son in you. And so you say, well, then what do I got to do to get that? 
That's the question I always get. Well, what do I got to do to get a revelation of Christ? <clears throat> First of all, you got to quit thinking in terms of a revelation. You need to start saying, Father, I, I want your son. That's what's in your heart. That's what you want to send forth in me. That's what you want to reveal in me. That's what you want to make known from the, from the beginning of ages and time. That's what you want. I want what you want. Your timing is perfect, but work on me and bring me to that so that you can get what you want instead of me feeling awkward because I'm the only one that hasn't seen Jesus in this place and I need to see him or something like that. That's, that's ridiculous. See, we can't be coming from an earthly point of view in this life. We have to come from his eternal point of view and, and attune our heart to his heart and to his desire and to what he wants and to, and to let the let the what is there's an old song that says let the things of earth grow strangely dim at the at, in your glory and grace <clears throat> and it does it grows dim because you know when you the revealing of him is the eternal son now it's not just our concepts we break him down and we move him down to this you know this little thing that you know, yes, and we think it's so big, but yes, he came and he died for us. And, you know, but usually that's, oh, thank you, because we're talking about I don't want to go to hell. So thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm for that. But I'm telling you, that will grow dim. You know, I was just talking about this. Right? I, you know, I talk about this a lot. <clears throat> but this, but it is, we're talking about not the finished work, but the one who was always finished. His nature, his way, his life has never been unfinished. And we see him and he, that he's revealed in us. This isn't seeing him in a, in a finished work that died for my sins. And so now that's a finished work. And then seeing him in relationship to even getting me in Christ because I was outside of Christ. All of that relates to us and the unfinishedness of us. Let's see the one who has never been unfinished and always the desire and the joy of the Father's heart. And let's have him revealed in us as life, you know. And uh, the way I was describing it recently was that it's like this big running stream, this big river that's flowing, and, and that's eternal. That was before and, you know, be long after. The eternal one, the ter eternal one, it's back to the eternal son of God now. But he is the firstborn of many, so we're in him. But we jump in that and <laughs> it catches, it goes, you know, and it always goes. If we're scratching around going, oh, you know, you know, and I'm, and I'm not, you know, I, I'm not talking about don't search the scriptures or, you know, I'm saying all of that will appear so much less when you see the, the one who's always been finished, who never needed a finished work, and you become in him, and he becomes in you, Okay. Bingo, <laughs> bingo, then, then, you, then you can look at these other things and go, thank you, Lord, yes, thank you. But I just want to thank you for you, the beauty of you, knowing you, to see you as you are instead of as I perceived you in those things. It, it breaks your heart, and then it breaks it open to be filled with him. Praise God, you know? Hallelujah. Anyway, so I need to press on here, though. <laughs> um, so verse 28 and 29, whom we preach. Okay, so he's saying this is the one we preach. What, let, me, let me read this in this other translation. It is this Christ we preach, warning with instruction everyone using, using this wisdom and not the world's in order to present every recipient unto God filled, full, and functioning by the reality of union in Christ. Verse 29, it is to this end that I strive and labor 
working by the same power and fullness that I wish to work in others. Well, <clears throat> what he's saying is, okay, so he's, he's saying in, in verse 20, whom we preach, he's saying, Christ in you is the one we preach. We don't just preach Jesus died or he's, he's been raised or we preach this firstborn son as the resurrection and the life and everything else and he lives in us and um, and he, sa he said prior to this that you may know all the riches that are yours the rich resources of his nature of his life you know Lord make me more loving the father just wants to say I don't want to make you more loving I want my son increased in you because he is love what do you want him to do? Break off a chunk of him and go, here's some love. You know, chew on that for a while and you'll be more loving. No, we're in union with <laughs> pure love. It's so ridiculous, you know. Make me more patient. He'd say, there's no way. <laughs> I've tried that and that don't work. That, you're the reason why I decided to send my son <laughs> and put him in <laughs> <laughs> because you're because we are what we are apart from Christ but by his life we have the resources of eternal life which is which is again him warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in union with Christ every man mature in the reality of the oneness that is Christ so that it is his life in your branch and it is his life in your branch that will bring forth the fruit, not your fruit. See, we say, Lord, make me fruitful. He's going, look, I'm tired of talking to you. <laughs> you know, abide in me and I in you. I know, but make me fruitful, <laughs> you know which proves that we don't understand. It doesn't matter how much we think we know. It's just better to put all that in a big bucket and dump it in the sewer and then flush the toilet and go, I know nothing, teach me your son. And he'll go, oh, well, this is good, you know. I'd be glad to. <laughs> um, Verse 29, where unto I also labor. Okay, so he's saying, I am laboring by the same thing I'm preaching. I preach a whom. That whom is Christ in you. I also am laboring by the same thing. I'm laboring by Christ in me. that'd be good okay tell me this is it possible to get all kind of revelation and all kind of stuff and really see stuff and write a lot of books and do all this kind of stuff and not actually function by that life okay I know it can happen because I did it for a long time me not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I did it. And then at a certain juncture, I, my heart began to break because I, I didn't see changes here. I didn't see Christ here. You know, after a while, you quit looking for changes, changes. You start looking for Christ to be the change. And you go, I don't want to change anymore. Because that's, that's the big deal in Christianity. I want to change. I want to change. Well, how about exchange? Your life for mine, Jesus would say. No, I don't really want that. I just, you know, I just want you to bless me and help me and change me so that people like me better. <laughs> Whereunto I labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Verse 28, end of verse 28. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to. My labor is a striving according to his working, 
not which work is on me from heaven, you know, oh God, which worketh in me mightily. He's saying, you know what? This Christ in you stuff works. And it's working in me mightily. And there were plenty of people who looked and said, well, you used to be a great man. You used to be a Pharisee. You were one of the top guys. Look at you. Look how you dressed. You don't have any respect from anybody. The only one seems to show any respect for you at all is God. <laughs> Strive, and he says, worketh in me mightily. This is what I want. This is where I want to live. I want that Christ in me life, which is him, to work in me mightily. Well, if it works in you mightily, in what form or fashion is it going to bring forth? whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ where unto I labor. I'm trying to help everybody else. My, it's God and others fulfilling the first two commandments, which Jesus said, you know, what's the greatest commandment the guy said to Jesus? And he said, to love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, soul, and strength and mind. And the other is like it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. In this, all of the law is fulfilled. Okay? Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about the nature of Christ within us who will not do everything in relationship to thinking about him. What do I get out of this? How will I look if I do this? this I don't like doing these kind of things. So da 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 That doesn't go through all of that stuff. It's a maze of self. I'm not asking you to be selfless. I'm just asking you to think about selfless. Just try that. So he's, just so you know, I only put down the scriptures here. I didn't have one note here to to speak from I knew that the Lord by his spirit wanted to re-challenge us to life but it just happens to be the theme of the first couple of chapters of Colossians so we can't go wrong with that we don't have enough time to start in <coughs> uh, chapter 2 In light of all that, listen to his, his, him bring that reality down into his earth life. Because we just looked at it. I strive by the life of Christ to bless others and to pour out the life that wants to, that does that through me. Christ in me is that hope for you and for me. And then uh, remember, there were no chapters and da 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 da. The next thing he would have said is. <clears throat> For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh that their hearts may be comforted being knit together in love under all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery and of the Father and of Christ. Let's pray. Father, just... Just begin to re-stir the pot in us as earthen vessels. And Lord, bring back the awe of the mystery. Bring back the awe of the mystery instead of the familiarity we have with it that it just doesn't move us or doesn't move us like it used to. So we ask it and we ask it because we want you to receive your son. We want you to receive the one that you from, from the beginning was your intention. The mystery that was hid. 
behind a veil was never meant to stay behind a veil, but was meant to come in us. It was never meant for a dark room left un, untouched and unvisited for a year until the high priest came in. And even at that, left without the true fulfillment of the word, which is your intention that it be Christ in us. Stir our hearts to see above religious teaching pertaining to these things and to peer into eternal reality, to see the, un, the, 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 the work that was never unfinished, Christ himself, in whom we live and move and have our being. Make it more than doctrines. Make it more than even revelations of Christ in these things. Make it the unveiling of Christ himself. We ask in Jesus' name.